wonderful sense of a free place to conquer in terms of audiences that are ever growing. Uh, there is a sense of, of freedom of reporting. I mean, in, not until I worked in America did I understand how tight the legal laws are in England and how constrained you are and how there, this whole atmosphere of sort of class and, and uh, just the, and the establishment law, and, the and the law, law, and the law are in terms actually, of libel. Are actually, you know, just something that British journalists accept. And I hadn't felt imprisoned about it when I was there, but working here, it's a very different phenomenon, which I think you feel too. I, it is. When I joined the Sunday Times as editor, I mean, I joined it earlier, and put up my hands in an exclamation, this should not happen. I found there was a wall here and a wall here. And it was a legal wall saying, you cannot say this. You cannot expose the threat of my children. You cannot campaign for the threat of my children. You cannot investigate. So how did you do it? Well, a certain With amount With all those pushback. Well, first you broke, of all, You broke down the walls. I mean... I broke down the walls. How did I break down the walls? First of all, I had a very rare thing, a lawyer who believed in publishing the truth. You'll miss truth in the CNN ads, okay, so you'll appreciate that. And he showed me how I might challenge the law in a construct, not just by saying, oh, oh, I'm gonna defy the law. There's nothing, I believe in the rule of law. So we had to do things as legally as we could, but challenge. And he gave me the idea, and secondly, the support of a proprietor, Roy Thompson, who totally believed in investigative journalism, who totally believed in challenging authority. In fact, when I took the job, the Let chairman said to me, you'll be totally free so long as you don't criticize the queen. I said, I said so it's okay to criticize her government? Yes, go ahead. So you, uh, thalidomide had an effect. Breaking of that story meant that that drug was no longer given to well, women. The, the greatest effect, we got compensation for the, for the children which was being benighted them. And secondly, the British government, when I won the case in Europe, had to change the law affecting contempt of court, which said that as soon as a case is before the courts, nobody can comment. That doesn't apply in the United States. And what about the effect on investigative journalism in today's world, not just in the new media world, the digital world that you're in now and pioneering, but also in the world where you see resources slashed and certainly not enough rain given to investigation? Well, I'm sure Tina will agree with this. We both constantly talk about this. And the fact is that as soon as you stop investigating, cover it, that means finding things out which somebody wants to conceal you are going to face disasters. Now, do you want some examples? The financial meltdown, not discovered, not detected, not reported in the newspapers. The war in Iraq. The re real reasons for going into Iraq, not investigated, not covered. Katrina, to a lesser extent. So we, uh, maybe Afghanistan, which you know a lot about. So we're actually living a life of what it's like to be without the press. So, Tina, can the digital media actually take the place of traditional media and all its resources and all its time and all its original reporting. Well, f let me first of all say is I think there is a bad rap in a sense that digital media has ruined, as it were, journalism for the mainstream media. I would say the mainstream media, so-called, has been ruined by the greed of managements. Because actually the greed of managements is what has disemboweled newspapers and frankly killed off investigative reporting long before uh, the digital world. I mean, in now the end, that we're in the digital world, and you're absolutely right about the resources and the profit motive, what can your media do to fill in if we're not going to have traditional investigative reporting, which is so vital but in so local vital. and national? But let me say this. She did a marvelous piece on the beast, which showed, which no newspaper did, an investigative piece of how members of Congress were bribed by Fanny and Freddie, the housing behemoths who led us into this terrible crisis. 126 models. And on the website, the Daily Beast, they showed which, em which congressman got ha what, how much money. But do you think it can have the same effect, Tina, when you look well, down I the do, line? You see, I actually do think it can. I think, unfortunately, we're in this very scary transition right now from one kind of media climate to another. It's kind of like the Industrial Revolution applied to media. So there's a kind of scary sort of uh, hiatus right now when the money isn't seem to be in either place. I actually think that we will be able to protect investigative journalism. I think financial models will be found to make websites profitable enough, which will simply mean allocating resources. And actually, I think there's so much uh, journalistic excitement amongst the young now, so much desire, in fact, to cover stuff, and so much ease of starting up things, that I actually do think, ultimately, investigative journalism can prosper. So it's interesting to hear you speak like this about investigative
investigative journalism because you're known more for the glossy for the highbrow lowbrow which you sort of brought into the the journalism lexicon whether it was at Vanity Fair New Yorker uh, Tatler etc I, I sense you being a little harder in your focus. No, no, Is that no, right, no. Tina? Well, well, you know, let absolutely. me say this in her defense. I'm <laughs> no, that wasn't the no, when, when, she, right. when she investigated, when you investigated, when you investigated how Princess of Wales phones were tapped, mm -hmm. everybody else had passed it by. You said, who tapped her phones? Were they tapped? Was it paranoid? And you investigated that right in your book about the Princess well, I did, of Wales. But that, of course, took me many months to investigate, to, to, to Christiane's point. I mean, the kind of stuff... I think what makes people very excited when they read uh, my paper chase, Harry's book, is that they do have a feeling of a world in which the money was there to support a journalistic ethos which does feel like it's evaporated. I mean, the kind of stuff that you did at the Sunday Times, it took time, it took passion, it took a big staff. I mean, you know, your investigations well, had, had a staff a of... big staff. Just hang on a second. Well, how many people well, were well, on your look, investigative team? I had 135 journalists on the Sunday Times when the New York Times had more than a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Washington Post had more than a thousand. We didn't have a large staff. Where did you get that idea? <laughs> I no, mean, but seriously, where did you speaking, get that idea? I mean, seven people, you know, <laughs> investigating yeah. solidamide and collating yes, the material. Yes, so yes. what did you have? If it wasn't a huge staff, what made the difference that we don't have today? Well, first of all, I, I, I only appointed geniuses. They had to come in with an IQ. No, seriously. They had to come up. We had a very disparate staff. We had antique dealers. We had former embezzlers, former military people. We had former spies. We had every, every former you could think of. So we had a variety of talent. Very important. They didn't come out of a homogeneous background. You know, know Harry's, Harry's anti-journalism school, and that's it. Well, I was in that sense, not in other senses. We had that. We had the, back, the confidence mm -hmm. that if we did expose something, the proprietor and the chairman would stick up for us and not wilt at the first complaint from an advertiser. And we will pick this up right after a break. More with Harry Evans and Tina Brown when we return.